Hostage, a Todd Mills mystery, book three in the series. Arthur R.D. Zimmerman, publisher, Scribble Pub. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 41. As soon as they turned the corner and started down the narrow hallway, Todd saw the door and was sure. Yes, there was no doubt this was the way he'd been led into the basement. Through the white door at the end, the tour guide had taken him and his photographer through it and then down three levels to the massive empty space where the journey to the center of the earth exhibit and ride was to be built. But even from here, Todd could tell the door would be locked, for right above the knob was a keypad that obviously required a combination. With Lyle right behind him, Todd raced down the passage and pushed down on the handle. Nothing happened. He then threw himself against the door, which didn't even budge. Damn it! Lyle pushed Todd aside, took hold of the handle, jammed it down, and hurled his large body against the plane of metal. Again, the door didn't even quiver. Great, thought Todd. Now what? Shoot it, demanded Todd. Lyle looked at the thing for a moment, shrugged, then pulled out his gun and fired twice. The lock shattered under the blast and the door drifted open. Heading in and leading the way, Todd said, It's straight down. Right. It was a plain industrial stairwell. Metal railing, concrete walls, fluorescent lighting, some emergency lights, and their footsteps reverberated up and down as they plunged lower. They took the step, two and three at a time, going down and around, past the first sublevel, then the second. Suddenly, Todd felt a firm hand on his shoulder. Nice and quiet, ordered Lyle, his voice hushed. Todd slowed, trying to recall the layout. He pictured in his mind a large space with sheetrock walls, a few rooms, and the metal columns. As far as Todd knew, they were still battling for funding for the exhibit, and construction had yet to start. Now, in the deepest level of the Mega Mall, they approached the last door. Holding his gun upward, Lyle tried to discern what or who might be beyond. While Todd pressed himself against the concrete block wall and strained to hear something, anything at first, there was nothing, then it came, that soft but firm rolling sound. Somewhere up above, the computer-run roller coaster had been started for the day, and yes, Todd knew with the utmost certainty this was the place. The sound on the videotape had emanated from here. Lyle quietly inched open the door, stepped through, and Todd followed. The chamber beyond was faintly lit with a few long fluorescent lights. He remembered walking through while the proud tour guide explained how the lava exhibit would be here, the dinosaur fossils there, the underground sea over there, and the operations room in the far back. But now, instead of visions of grandeur, there were only blank walls. Todd slipped into the lead, quietly moving along. Reaching a corner, he hesitated. Yes, he thought they had to be somewhere back here. He pointed around the corner and Lyle nodded. Todd was about to move on when he heard something, a shuffle of steps. He paused. Nothing. Then proceeded, rounding the corner and entering a large empty space, perhaps thirty feet wide and a hundred feet long. His attention was immediately caught by a closed door on the far wall. At the bottom of the door, a strip of light glowed softly. Todd looked at Lyle and nodded, holding his gun high in both hands. Lyle moved swiftly, yet carefully, across the space. Todd hurried after him, silently crossing to the wall and pressing himself against it. Lyle slid over to the door, listened, then moved right in front of it, his gun held out and ready to fire. He glanced once at Todd, lifted his foot, and kicked in the door, which burst open under his force. Todd rushed after him, entering a small room littered with sleeping bags. Boxes and a small television. Shit, snapped Lyle, finding it otherwise empty. He quickly checked a side room and then the bathroom, which was rich with a foul odor and an odd mound of plastic. This was it, said Todd, adding it all up. They were here. Look, there's the video camera. The air in here was too thick, too stuffy. He couldn't have left that long ago and Todd turned, dashed out. He glanced up and down the long room. Suddenly... Something started struggling at the far end, and the next instant a person lunged out of the shadows. Stay out of this, Todd, screams Rollins. 
A second person jumped out, jabbed a gun in the first man's head, and dragged him away. Yet as horrible as the situation was, Todd was struck by a wave of relief, for this meant Rollins wasn't a willing participant. Rollins! He shouted, bursting into a run. Todd charged through the long space. With Lyle speeding after him, a third and a fourth figure appeared, and yes, Todd could tell one of them was Congressman Johnny Clarendon. A distant door opened, and then all four of them slipped into the innermost parts of the Mega Mall and disappeared. Spreading all the way, Todd reached the passage before Lyle. Wait! ordered Lyle before Todd could rip open the door. Todd resisted the temptation, waiting until Lyle rushed up, braided his gun, and slowly pulled back the door. The next chamber was filled with a mass of gray pipes, huge tubes running horizontally one on top of another through the lower ceilinged room. Exactly, recalled Todd. This was no boiler room. The tour guide had told him about this, bragging about the heart of the Mega Mall's cooling system. Such a huge structure filled with so many lights, and so many people generated massive amounts of heat. So much, in fact, that the main concern over here in Minnesota was cooling. In this frigid climate, the heat was turned on only two or three weeks a year. The rest of the time, it was all about cooling, and a massive underground system had been developed with pipes that plunged several hundred feet down into the earth so that the heated water they carried would be cooled before returning to the air conditioning system. This room, Todd knew, was only the tip of the system. Something clanked straight ahead and to the right, and Todd followed Lyle into the next room, one slow step at a time. Peering ahead, Todd saw that in some 50 feet, the pipes curved to the side. There had to be another way out, a far exit, and they continued along, Lyle clutching his gun in both hands and swinging it from side to side. Out of nowhere came an odd noise. What was it? Merely water churning through the pipes? More footsteps. Then it came again, the sound of hushed movement. Todd stopped. Were they over there, to the left? Echoing up and down the chamber, a single drop fell on the concrete floor, followed by a second. Lyle turned around, put one finger to his lips, then nodded and motioned to Todd to follow. They continued another twenty feet, and the sound of the dripping water grew, breaking that came the slow, barely audible vibrations of something being dragged. Reaching another gap in the pipes, Todd and Lyle hesitated. Something clicked. A door? And Todd spun to the side. Straight ahead, two people suddenly lunged down a skinny man, pressing something against the second one's neck. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! He shouted, his voice nervous and quick. I've got a syringe full of HIV-infected blood, man, and if you come any closer, I'll inject him with it. And and this is Johnny Clariton, the congressman. I'll pump him full of AIDS, I will. Elliot, please, begged Clariton, not even daring to flinch, his spine rigid with fear. Todd stood perfectly still, and he forced his voice to sound calm and even. I, we just want to talk. My name's Todd, and... I know perfectly well who you are, you TV turkey, said the skinny one. I know all about you. Now go away, be a good faggot, and let us finish our business. But maybe we can... Oh, shut, just shut up. I mean it. Either of you comes any closer, and I'm going to give Mr. Gay Public Enemy Number 1 a full dose of the Supreme Cootie. Courtesy, I might add, of your handsome dying lover, he said, tapping the syringe with a naughty giggle. Horrifying, Todd. Couldn't move. Didn't know what to say, let alone do. I mean, man, chattered Elliot. My arms and my legs are so skinny, they're just toothpicks. Not much left of them at all, and my veins are in shit shape. So, so we borrowed some blood from the nice cop. A voice cracked, not fifteen feet behind Todd, coolly pronouncing, You guys do anything fancy, and this one gets it too. Todd whipped around to see Matthew. The bald-headed leader pressing a gun to Rollins' right temple. Ah, Jesus, now what? Looking up, Rollins pleaded to be understood. Todd, they took it from me. My blood, they forced me to. Rollins, began Todd, taking a half-step forward. Stop, Todd, screamed Matthew, 
his face bursting red. I mean it. I'll blast this brain out, and Elliot will shoot Clarendon full of AIDS. Todd was perfectly still. You and your friend there get down on the floor, commanded Matthew. Now! And you, muscles, put the gun down and slide it over here. Todd looked over at Lyle, saw him hesitate, then watched as he placed the gun on the floor and gave it a shove with his foot. Of course, they had no choice, and Todd began bending over. Matthew scooped up Lyle's gun and barked. You know what to do, assholes. You've done this for me before, so get down and put your hands behind your fucking heads now. You tell him, cackled Elliot from the other side. Todd went first, placing his knees on the floor, then leaning forward and pressing his hands onto the cold concrete. Lyle stretched out to his right, and then both of them clasped their hands behind their heads. Todd glanced over, saw Matthew shoving Rollins toward him. Okay, now you get down too, Rollins, ordered Matthew. Get down on the floor next to your boyfriend. In a tiny voice, Clarendon said, Please, just leave me here too. Oh, shut you, ninny, Elliot chided as Todd caught a glimpse of Rollins slowly lowering himself. He started trembling inside. Dear God, how crazy with Matthew. Just what was he going to do to them? Todd closed his eyes, slipped his leg over, and tapped Rollins on the ankle. Rollins nudged back. The next moment, Matthew was leaning over Rollins, strapping first his hands behind his back, then his feet with flex cuffs. He then stepped over Todd and cuffed Lyle as well. As for you, my friend, Mr. Todd, laughed Matthew, kicking Todd on the foot. This time, you're the one coming along for the ride. What? shouted Rollins, twisting on his side. No, Matthew, leave him out of this. Just shut up and stay down, shouted Matthew. Sorry to dump you, Rollins, but Elliot and I are going to need all the exposure we can get. Absolutely, Dalink. And Todd's a lot more well-known than you, continued Matthew. Now get up, Todd. His voice low as he lay on the floor. Lyle advised, do as they say, Todd. You're fucking right, snapped Matthew. As Todd slowly pushed himself up, he glanced at Lyle and saw his hands twisting against the flex cliffs. Just how strong was he? As soon as Todd was standing, Matthew jabbed his gun into Todd's back and said, Now, just be a good boy and do like I say, or it's going to be lights out. Am I clear? Todd nodded and glanced down the hall at Elliot, who was clutching Clarendon almost leaning on him for support as he kept the tip of the needle all but pressed into the congressman's neck. One false move by either one of them and Clarendon could be on that long, dark road. You're crazy, Matthew, yelled Rollins, trying unsuccessfully to wrench himself free. Don't you see that? You're doing more harm than good for AIDS. Every straight person in the world is going to hate gays after this. I'm just determined that's all. Oh, wow, muttered Elliot. This is so great. Now we've got two famous people. Matthew nudged Todd with a gun. Okay, just go over there toward Elliot. We're going to go out another way. Got it? Todd nodded. And remember, no fancy stuff. Todd, called Rollins. I'll be okay, he promised. Matthew echoed. I'm telling you, just stay here or Todd gets it. Elliot and Clarendon went first. Todd and Matthew second. Continuing through the cooling room, they reached a far door and entered a second stairway. A tall, impersonal space with concrete block walls and stark lighting. We're going all the way up, explained Matthew. Elliot shoved Clarendon along and said, Say, what do you think of the homosexual agenda now, Mr. Johnny Congressman? His voice deep and low and full of hate. Clarendon glanced back at Todd. Pigs! That's what these people are, pigs! Elliot laughed. Careful what you say, Johnny. All I gotta do is prick you with this teensy weensy little needle and you got big problems. Clarendon's face bloomed red and in a calm but very strained voice he said, Just let me go. I'll help you. I promise I will. Oh, really? replied Elliot, doing his best to sound earnest. Yes. I'll get you all the latest drugs, everything you need. Wow. So now you're no longer the wicked congressman, but Glinda, good witch of the West. I swear I'll get you into the best hospital and get you the best doctors. 
Don't listen to him, snapped Matthew. Girlfriend, said Elliot to Matthew with a laugh. You think I'd start believing a politician now? Changing thoughts and changing tone, he said, Hey, Todd, I made a video, too. My whole story's back there on tape. Back in that room. Remember that, okay? And make sure it gets on the air, okay? Promise me that, please. Sure, replied Todd, fearing that Elliot already knew how this was going to end. Oh, and there are three people in the walk-in refrigerator at some cookie place. They're probably already gotten out, but you better check. Okay. With the gun pressed deep into his back, Todd took hold of the metal railing and started up. Some ten steps behind Elliot and Clarendon, he climbed one step after another, and behind him he could hear Matthew's labored breathing as he gulped and wheezed. By the time they'd climbed one flight, Matthew's exhaustion was more than evident. Not, not so fast, gasped Matthew, reaching out with his free hand and grasping onto Todd's belt for support. Holy cow, huffed Elliot, clearly exhausted as well. I'm not the great athlete I once was. They rested a brief moment and then, as if they were scaling a mountain, Matthew drove them all upward. The climb proved too much, though, and they paused again on the next landing, waiting so Matthew could catch his breath, which he couldn't. When they'd made it up all three levels and were back at ground level, Todd glanced over his shoulder, saw Matthew dripping with sweat. Just, just wait a minute, said Matthew, his voice faint as he struggled for air. Keeping his gun trained on Todd, Matthew groped for the wall, leaned against it, and started coughing. He then bent over, clutched his forehead with his left hand. You don't look so good, said Todd. No shit. It can end right now, you know. Why don't you let me... Fuck off, Matthew tried to straighten up, but swooned and reached again for the wall. We're going all the way, aren't we, Elliot? Elliot struggled to catch his breath as well, and then in an odd, almost serene voice replied, Yep, we are all the fucking Thelma and Louise way, man. Oh, shit, thought Todd, fearful of what that implied. Elliot, just... Just... Matthew, Matthew started hacking, then continued, saying, Just keep that syringe right on Clarendon's neck. Yes, my captain, replied Elliot. I got it right up against his skin. It's curtains if he so much as makes a move. I don't like. Ah, oh, Christ, muttered Clarendon as beads of perspiration formed on his brow. Okay, let's do it, said Matthew, stabbing the pistol back into Todd. Let's go. Nothing like a dramatic entry, huh? Todd said, Matthew, we can still get you out of this. Shut the fuck up. Now just open the door and head out. I'm going to be stuck to you like glue. Matthew moved behind Todd, clutching an arm around Todd's waist and jabbing the gun into Todd's temple. Todd took a deep breath, then did as he was told, opening the door and proceeding down the plain white service hall toward the heart of the Mega Mall. Reaching the three-story main corridor, they emerged between Heavenly and Store overcome with angels and the big steep which was filled with stacks of perfume, glancing through palm trees and banners, carts and planters. Todd saw no one. Head over to those elevators, ordered Matthew. You with me, Elliot? You bet, he called. Suddenly a voice behind them said, Hey, Mel, look at here. Aren't we glad we're the last ones out? Oh, brother, muttered Matthew. Todd halted, looked to his right, and saw two mall guards in front of a store emblazoned with the words, Mega Barbie. While Mel and his partner seemed most determined to do something, anything, they stood weaponless and hence powerless in front of a showcase filled with pink Splendor Barbie, a life sign figurine all done up in an explosion of pink chiffon. Oh, Jesus Christ, laughed Matthew. You two turkeys don't even have guns. Yeah, agreed Elliot in a voice that seemed to be getting calmer and softer by the moment. Like, what are you going to do? Throw your walkie-talkies at us? Matthew swung his gun away from Todd's head, aimed not directly at the guys, but 
just to the right of them and fired two shots into the Barbie showcase. In a single instant, the glass shattered and pink splendor Barbie exploded, her tall plastic body shattering into a thousand pieces and her head and behind white blonde hair tumbling into the store. Turning to the guards, Matthew laughed like the devil and shouted, Now, which one of you am I going to kill first? The guards bolted, tearing down the teal carpeted hallway. Clearly amused, Matthew continued chuckling as he jabbed the gun back against Todd's head and ordered, Keep moving! With the hot barrel against his temple, Todd led the foursome onward, moving around some planters, past a teddy bear shop, a music box shop, an enormous shoe store, and to the bank of elevators. He pressed a button, one of the doors immediately opened, and Matthew, Todd, Elliot, and Clarendon boarded the all-glass lift. Elliot pressed the number three, and in a faint voice said, Going up! Next stop, chaos! As they rose past the second floor, Todd saw a handful of guards, some charging toward the elevators. No, those weren't mere shopping mall guards, not geeky men and women in white shirts and black polyester pants. They weren't even local police. Todd realized as the glass car continued ascending dressed in black uniforms and helmets and carrying some machine guns, they were quite obviously hostage rescue team commandos. A bell chimed. The lift came to a gentle stop on the third floor and Todd felt Matthew draw closer, yet pressing himself tightly against Todd's back. When the doors eased open, Todd stared out at two marksmen, their guns aimed at him. Get back or I'm going to blow this guy's heads off, shouted Matthew, tapping Todd's head with the gun. Do it, seconded Elliot, or this guy's going to get a big dose of AIDS. Suspended between Matthew and the submachine guns, Todd felt his heart leaping wildly, his body trembling and sweating. At first, it seemed as if the sharpshooters weren't going to budge, but then without lowering their weapons, they backed away. As he nudged Todd out of the lift, Matthew commanded, Okay, turn right. With the guns trained on them, Todd led the way down the hall. Matthew hung on to him, and Elliot and Clarendon followed just a few feet behind. Aware that the sharpshooters were looking for that one moment, that millisecond that might give them a clear shot, Todd moved cautiously past a blue jean store, finally turning a corner and entering the food court, which glowed with sizzling red neon hamburgers, chilling blue neon shakes, and dancing orange neon french fries. Lining both sides of the massive V-shaped space were several dozen fast food booths with brightly lit menu boards, offering everything from pizza to mini donuts to sushi to deep dish chocolate chip cookies. Go all the way out there, commanded Matthew, whispering into Todd's ear and shoving him along all the way to the edge. Todd led the way around a column on which hung a huge neon Pepsi cup with flashing bubbles, then steered through a mass of formica clad tables. As he moved along, Todd was suddenly aware that they weren't surrounded by simply one or two additional sharpshooters, but at least a dozen more, all of whom fanned into strategic positions. Carefully proceeding through the food court, Todd headed onto the ground balcony, a huge perch covered with still more tables and chairs which jutted out over the entire amusement park. With Matthew still pressing the gun into Todd's temple, he went all the way to the edge and peered out. Off to one side hung an enormous space rocket and moon, constructed of multicolored Lego blocks, while in the distance stood the Ferris wheel, which was so far away it looked tiny, spying something snaking and curling through the treetops. Todd realized it was the roller coaster, completely empty yet maintaining its computerized schedule. With a quick glance over the railing, Todd saw down below not only another dozen guns aimed up at them, but a handful of television crews and their cameras as well. Very good, cackled Matthew, his hand trembling as he ground the gun into Todd's scalp. Can their telephoto lenses reach this far, Toddy? Yeah, and I'm sure they won't miss a second, Matthew called. Hey, Elliot, we're going to go down in history. Yeah, we made it, he said softly out of the corner of his eyes. Todd watched Elliot nudge Clarendon up to the railing and peer out over the largest of interior spaces. For a long time, Elliot just scanned the area, seeing it all. 
the forest of trees, the huge columns, the sparkly lights, all the rides as if for the first time. Or was it? Todd feared. Perhaps the last? His voice fade, Elliot said. So do I do it now, Matthew? Is it time to inflict the ultimate experience upon the evil congressman? Oh, God, pleaded Clarendon. Please, please don't. But why shouldn't I? asked Elliot as I lucid as he was perplexed. Otherwise, you'll never understand the damage people like you have done. Please, I swear it, I'll help you. Just don't. Please don't. Clarendon, you were such a fucking baby, said Matthew, who then turned and leaned over the railing and yelled to the journalist below. You guys, with the cameras, make sure you get this. Glancing the other way, Todd saw a movement. It was Rollins, bounding past a hamburger stand and heading straight for them. Several black-clad HRT guys leaped out and grabbed him, but Lyle, right behind, came to his aid, and Rollins pushed through, maneuvering in and out of the tables and chairs. Rollins rushed on, then slowed, as he approached the edge of the grand balcony. Ah, shit, groaned Matthew upon spotting him. Todd shouted, Rollins, stay away! Pay no attention, Rollins calmly said. Don't do it, Matthew. Don't kill Todd. Get the hell out of here, shouted Matthew. Rollins, his brawny frame quite still, ignored him and calmly continued, saying, It's me you want to kill, not Todd. Oh, is that right? Absolutely, you gave me a death sentence, Matthew. You passed HIV to me, so why don't you just do it? Why don't you just shoot me and finish off what you started? Oh, Jesus, moaned Matthew. After all, I don't want to get as sick as you. What? It's too much for you, tough guy. And I certainly don't want to get as ugly as you either, Matthew flinched. Listen, if you think this is going to save your boyfriend, you're wrong. You look like shit, you know it. And shut up. And I don't want that. Rollins waited a moment, then slipped to the edge of a table and added, You used to be the handsomest man I'd ever seen. Matthew hesitated, then snapped. Rollins, get the hell out of here now. Everyone said that about you. How gorgeous you were. It was no surprise you were so successful as a model. Everyone lusted after you. All the guys. But now look at you. Stop it! People run from you, don't they? I mean, you look like some sort of freak that must be a real hard for you. Listen, I... AIDS is so damn ugly, isn't it? I mean, can you even stand to look at yourself in the mirror? Rollin shook his head. I just don't want to look as bad as you do now. All the oozing sores and the wasting and... Shut the hell up! I don't want to rot like... Stop it! No, Matthew. You're going to have to shoot me. That's what I want. I want you to kill me so I don't look as hideous as you. Matthew shifted from one foot to the other and blurted, You know if you don't shut up, I'm going to kill Todd. No, you're not. Todd glanced over, saw Elliot and Clarendon hanging on every word, swinging his eyes across the food court. Todd spied the sharpshooters, frozen in position, one against a column, another leaning on a tabletop, another perched by a garbage can, all of their guns trained on Matthew, and therefore Todd as well, his body blistering with sweat. Todd said, Rollins, I... You know, Matthew, I'm pissed off too continued Rollins, ignoring everything and everyone else. I'm pissed as hell at you for doing this to me, for making me sick. Rollins started forward. And I'm angrier than hell that people like Clarendon have exploited. Stop right there or I'll blast his brains out. Rollins halted, took a breath, then said, Actually, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe you should kill Todd. I mean, I don't want to see him get sick too. He's probably got it, you know? I probably gave it a maids. And I sure as hell don't want to watch him start puking and shitting his brains out. Todd closed his eyes. Todd closed his eyes. Bit his lower lip. He took a deep breath. Felt his heart slamming against his chest. Was Rollins as insane as Matthew? In fact, continued Rollins, I kind of like that idea. You could shoot Todd and then he won't have to suffer. That's pretty good. Matthew's eyes... Flitted about, he rocked from side to side, then looked over the edge at the cameras below. 
They better be getting this live. And then you could shoot me too, Rollins nodded. That would be a great relief. You think so? demanded Matthew, turning back and pressing the gun against Todd's temple. So hard that Todd's head bent to the side. Yeah, I know so. Just go ahead. Shoot. Todd, and then shoot me. I don't care anymore. What does it matter? We're all going to die, all of us. All the gay men in the world. It's kind of what we deserve, don't you think, for fucking around? I mean, how many guys did you screw in your life? With the barrel of the gun digging into his head, Todd pleaded. Rollins, just calm down. Just... Matthew turned to Elliot and screamed. Do it, Elliot! Do it now! Shoot the blood into Clarendon! Rollins' tone was smooth and even. I mean, you walked out on Kurt because you couldn't watch him die, and I don't think I could watch Todd die either. So perhaps you should just... Shut up, you bastard! Or did you leave Kurt because you were just afraid of getting it? Because it freaked you out so much. Rollins paused and said, Hey, how did you get it anyway? I guess it doesn't make much difference, but... It's always interesting to know. Did you give it to Kurt, or did Kurt give it to you? Care to confess to us? Stick the needle into Clarendon's neck, Elliot. Rollins blurted. But you have to admit, walking out on Kurt just when he got sick and needed you most makes even Congressman Clarendon look like a saint. Elliot gazed at the roller coaster as it whooshed nearby like a ghost of better times, then turned to Matthew and mumbled. I... I... Do it, Elliot! But do it, you moron! Matthew, you know what Kurt's last words were, taunted Rollins. Nervously fidgety behind Todd, Matthew yelled, Kurt's dead, I don't care. Of course you don't care, you left him. I just thought you might... Shut up, he screamed. Matthew, I was right there when he died, right there by his side, and you know what he said? I don't care! He said, tell Mr. Wonderful I hate him. Stop it, he shrieked. Those were his exact words. His last words. His what? Last words. Suddenly, Todd switched back to a different time. A different tragedy altogether. Dear God, what was Rollins saying? That he'd been there that fateful night? In Todd's mind, he pictured a man in a dark coat slipping down the street and creeping into a dark apartment. Could that have been Rollins? Had he been the one, and could whatever have happened in Kurt's final moments explain the change in Rollins in the last month? The sulky nights? The disappearance of his laughter? I suppose it really doesn't make any difference who gave it to whom, but you know what's really terrible, Matthew? The fact that you left him, that you abandoned your partner that makes you a real shit. Rollins shook his head. You broke Kurt's heart, you know? That's not true. Oh, yes, it is. You destroyed him. And do you know what I did for the man who once loved you more than anything in the world? Do you have any idea what I did because I loved my friend so much? And he was in so much pain? Stop it. He was bleeding and shitting and coughing and crying. And he hated you for every miserable moment. He did not. Yes, he did. I'm going to. He told me how he hated you with all his heart for leaving him like that. He told me you were the worst kind of human being taunted Rollins. And you know what, Matthew? Kurt was right. You are the worst. Ten times worse than some pathetic politician like Clarendon. And you're going to rot in hell for what you did to the only person who ever loved you. Todd sensed it. The subtle change of the gun against his head. The barely perceptible switch in Matthew's grip. Oh, Jesus, he knew what Matthew was going to do a split second before Matthew even moved. No! screamed Todd, elbowing Matthew in the stomach and shoving him back. But it was of little use. Matthew stumbled just as he fired over Todd's right shoulder. In an instant, Todd saw everything great in his life. 
destroyed as a bullet rocketed into Rollins, hurling him back onto a table. Rollins! Todd dove forward, and as soon as he was out of the way, the sharpshooters opened fire on Matthew. There was one rapid explosion of gunfire. A half dozen shots that came so quickly. They sounded nearly as one. Every single bullet bit into its target, and Matthew's body danced if his suspended, then dropped to the floor, his punctured body spurting his poisoned blood everywhere. Aware of nothing else, Todd scrambled through the chairs as his lover collapsed. Rollins! Elliot, his sunken face stretched with terror abruptly, pushed away the congressman and threw aside the syringe. He then clamped his eyes shut and slapped his hands over his ears. Standing there in hideous anticipation, Clarendon bent out of the way and bolted for safety, yelling, Shoot him! Get him! Now! Elliot didn't move, didn't open his eyes. He just stood there, undoubtedly expecting and perhaps hoping for a hail of bullets. Something, anything to blast him from this world into the next. There was, however, nothing. Not a single blast of a single bullet. Nothing to take him beyond. Shoot him, you idiots! Shrieked Clarendon, tripping and pawing over chairs and tables as he stumbled out of the way. Instead, four men with machine guns swooped upon Elliot. Their weapons trained on him the entire time in one orchestrated and ballet-like instant. They swarmed around and engulfed Elliot, seizing the skinny, frail man with ease. Todd saw the blood leaping from Rollins' upper left chest and shouted, Get a medic! Hurry! Falling to the floor, on his back, Rollins clasped one hand over his wound in a desperate but feeble attempt to stem the flow of blood, which was gushing with manacle pressure. Back! He gasped as Todd neared. I'm here! Rollins held out his blood-drenched hand, cried in the weakest of voices. Stay away! Horrified by what he saw, Todd couldn't stop. He grabbed Rollins' bloodied hand, scrambled down, and knelt in the pulley blood. He touched Rollins' shirt, looked for some way to stem death. But the wound was so big, the blood flowing so quickly. Get back, whispered Rollins, panicking, not knowing what to do. Todd reached up, ran his own now bloody hand through his hair, then pleaded and screamed. Where's the doctor? Rollins closed his eyes. Then opened them and looked up. His lips parted. He tried to speak, but couldn't. He grabbed Todd's arm and squeezed. And finally, his eyes fell shut. Rollins, stay with me, shouted Todd, caressing Rollins' face. I'm right here. Don't go, Rollins. Don't go. Beside me, I hear pain and confusion. Such suffering. It's Todd, and he's crying so hard. I'm afraid something's breaking with him. If only I could open my mouth. Because there's so much left to say. This really isn't scary. No, my eyes are closed, but it's not dark. In fact, there it is, that light, the one that always talk about. So pure and white, beckoning me to come, calling me with its clarity. There, I can still move my fingers, and that's your arm. Todd, that beautiful, wonderful arm that you used to wrap around me. I'm closing my fingers, clutching you. Do you feel that? Do you? I'm not trying to hang on. I'm really not. I just want you to understand. Sweetheart, that I'm going to be okay. That I'm fine. Really, I am. In fact, I feel flush. 
with a kind of overwhelming sense of well-being. If only I could make you believe this. If only I could move my lips and smile. <laughs> hey, right, this moment, I'm realizing that the secret of life is like a ball. That you have to keep rolling. So, that's what you got to do. Time, just push, push on. Because after all, it's like your old boss used to say. This ain't no dress rehearsal. Wait. The light's getting brighter, and there's someone out there. A radiant face and outstretched hand. Kurt, is that you? Of course it is, says the smiling, glowing face. What the hell are you doing here? What is this? Am I going crazy? Am I hallucinating? This vision is so real. I'm sorry, Kurt. Really, I'm sorry. I've regretted it every day since then. What are you talking about? But... Rollins, you did me a favor. Holy shit. You saw how sick I was. And you knew I didn't want to die. In a strange place. Then I just wanted to die at home. The cyanide was my ideal, you fool. Yes, but you just followed through with our little plan. You helped me when I needed it most. You did as I asked. Kurt's smiling now. Now, do as I say. Go back to him. It's not your time. Go back to Todd. He's the one that needs you. And don't give up. Someday, someday real soon, this AIDS crap is going to be over. The white light is beginning to dim. The wondrous face is receding. Kurt! Kurt! That's it, said Todd, trotting alongside the gurney as they rushed Rollins to a waiting ambulance. Take a breath. Good. Thank God. Oh, thank God, thought Todd. His eyes beaded with tears. As he saw Rollins' eyes flutter open, the hostage rescue team, and of course, considered every possibility, including emergency medical care, which they had rushed to the third floor even before Matthew had fired the first bullet. And within 30 seconds of being shot, two emergency doctors and a nurse, all of them wearing heavy rubber gloves, smocks, and goggles, descended upon Rollins. Stopping the horrendous flow of blood and slapping an oxygen mask over his mouth and nose. They'd saved him. Rollins had been tumbling away and in another minute or two, he would have died as it was. They'd caught him just as he was slipping from this world. It's okay. You're going to be okay, Couch Todd. You're on a journey and they're going to take you to the hospital. I'll stay right with you. Rollins tried to say something. No, just be quiet, buddy. He's... Mm. He saw Rollins' eyes flint bound, and Todd explained. You've been shot, but you're going to be all right. Elliot's okay for now. They have him in custody. He wasn't shot, but he's awfully weak. He added, Matthew's dead. Beneath the plastic mask, Rollins opened his mouth and... faintly said... Kurt, don't worry. We'll talk later. But I know you did something quite drastic for your closest friend. Everything's going to be okay. Todd lifted Rollins' left hand to his mouth and kissed it. I love you, and I'm never going to let you go. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. 
and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time, being true to their values.